So my um, experience with a wheelchair is very limited and, and also very broad at the same time. <clears throat> my injury happened as I was training for the Olympic Games. I was, I was going for my third shot at trying to make the team. And I told you I was the eighth fastest hurdler in the country at the time. I was on the All Army World Class Athlete Program team, and I was training in Hayes, Kansas. So I had a race the next day, and I just run a sub 50 second hurdle race, and I was on my way to really make some good progress to making the actual team. But I went across the hurdle, the third hurdle, and I landed wrong, and my leg hyperextended. It snapped, when it bent to the inside, it severed the artery behind the kneecap. And my femur, or my patella, rose up about three inches over my femur and it took out that, that artery, blocked it for a period of about 11 hours. So I was taken from uh, Hayes, Kansas, to Wesley Medical Center in Wichita, Kansas, where they reduced my knee, popped it back in place, and they still were not getting a reading of pulse reading on the lower portion of my liver. So at that time, the doctor came in and said, you know, we've tried to clean your wound out, but you've lost so much blood, and, and your lower limb has been without blood for such a long time. We're gonna, we have to, we cleaned out your gastrocnemius muscle, your legs will be fused at the knee, you have about 20% you know, range of motion, and you will be in a wheelchair or a walker for the rest of your life. Or you can take door number two and take an amputation. So now what kind of choice is that between not really walking and not walking? <laughs> so that was my decision. And I'm coming to your, the answer to your, your question. The doctor, well, the doctor came in one moment I, uh, on, on the next day after the amputation, and Dr. Mullins took one look at me and knew that something was wrong. The night before, I was sitting in that hotel, that, that room, thinking about my life. And I'm married, I got a kid, I'm on the Army, I'm about to go to Officer Candidate School, I'm on the way to Olympic Games. And all those things emotionally were weighing heavy on me because all that, my mind was gone. Totally gone. So I thought to myself, you know, who, who am I now? What, what, what's my identity? Who, is, my, is my wife going to still stick around? Is my son still going to see me as his dad? My mom and dad, they're in the room. Are they, are they going to still accept me as their son? How is society going to view me? Do I still have a job in the United States Army? Well, can I still support my family? All these things were pressing on me as I'm looking down at this limb that's no longer there. And the pain was tremendous at that point. I thought the pain was excruciating before with my knee kind of blown out of proportion, and they got me on these meds, and I, and I was still not able to sleep, turn over, and weak. So I, you know, male deductive reasoning, you take the leg away, and I'm good. But no, there's this thing called phantom sensation and phantom pain. And I'm having all these phantoms hitting me, and I feel like there's two things that are happening. One, that there is a sledgehammer that's driving against the bottom of my stump, and that there's a, like a knife sawn at the back of my Achilles tendon. That's what was on me in phantom pain for at least six months when I was dealing with it. So Dr. Mullins comes in, sees me struggling with my situation, and he wheels me out, to, tells my wife, Alice, to wheel me outside. And as she does, I'm just kind of dejected, dejected state, head down. And she parks me in the wheelchair at an inaccessible playground. And in that wheelchair, at that moment in time, I felt confined and I felt that I was bound to that chair. Couldn't get out of it. Couldn't physically get out of it. I was too weak to physically get out of the chair. I was too weak, I couldn't even stand up on my right leg. So here I had been a sub 50 second hurdler five days ago, I can't even push myself out of the chair right now. So there I sat in that chair, pretty motionless, watching my son and daughter, a son and son and, uh, and wife play on the swing set. And I lost it. I just I broke down. So I felt the full brunt of what it meant to be changed, what it meant to be different, to what it meant for society to have all these things on me, and with my own attitudinal barriers on myself against other folks that I saw with impairments, because now I was a part of that category. So I was having to wrestle with this physicality now down to this frailty of a, of a person. So I lost it. I started crying, falling, and my wife, she saw me in that state. 
And she comes running over and says, what's going on, baby? What's wrong? What's wrong? And I began to articulate everything that was going on the night before. And she said the words that stopped my downward spiral. She said, you, you know what, John? We're going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. It's just our new normal. So I began to think about that, and I said, you know, maybe it's not about what I've lost in life. Maybe it's about the opportunities I can create in life. Maybe it is about creating a new normal. Because the resilience, you don't really come back to where you are. Coming back to where I am means I have my leg back. That's never happening. So I'm a little bit different, but maybe I'm still the same. And I look over, and John Jr., Jumps off the swing, does a little backflip, comes flying over me. Daddy, 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 what's going on? In those 20 yards he ran, in five seconds it took him to get there. He had just validated me as his father and created his new normal. So that's what I had to do. I had to create my new normal. And so going back to the question of the wheelchair, the wheelchair at that moment before I rolled up, felt as a confinement, as I was bound to it. This was now my life. Couldn't do anything else. The wheelchair after I went away was liberating because it gave me legs. It gave me life. It gave me freedom to do what I wanted to do, even though I could not actually walk. And that's the perspective shift that I think every person that has some type of trauma and must use a wheelchair at some point, point in time, it's not an identifier of who they are intellectually. It's just a mode to get around. And every single thing like that, the, my prosthetic now, is just a mode which helps me get around it and, and just to walk. But it goes down at times and I have to go without it, go on crutches or go back into a chair that I, that I do have. And it is different because there is still the stigma of when you are in a wheelchair, people look at you differently. Because A, you're not the same height. And you look, you're look you looked at more of an, as an obstruction to, to impeding my progress to get to where I want to go. If I wanted to sit up in the back row right now and I look around the room, how do I get there? I gotta go like that kid in the, in the, uh, in the video. I gotta break, drag my chair up the stairs to get to the back. Maybe I don't want to sit in the front row, right? When I go to the stadium, they got this little designation for me and my family member to sit right there. But sometimes it also works to your advantage. Go to Disney World, get to ride the rides first, right? And so you can play those things and you kind of, we call it in the disability community, we bought the disability card. Because you get to go on the, on the airplane first and all the other stuff, right? So those are things that are liberating and kind of play around with some of the stuff, but there is a stigma that's attached to being in that chair. And that stigma is something that we have to think of in our, in our minds that it's not the chair. I'm going to look at the person who's in the chair. They're not a wheelchair bound. They're a wheelchair user. It's, has anybody been in a plane when they've had some, an aisle chair put the person the person wheelchair on the plane? What happens during that time? You said you nod your head in the back. No? Okay, okay. No, okay. Well, you have to wait. Yeah, so when you get on the plane, you're waiting for the person to get on to, to do the aisle chair. Then when you get off the plane, what happens? You go first. That's it? The person in the chair is the last one off. The person that uses the wheelchair is the last one off. So now you get a tight connection. She's got to go overseas. She's making it, she, got to, she has to go to her, uh, a world championship to uh, try to make the last international flight. But she's the last one off this flight on this tight connection. How does she make that work? So those are the things that we're trying to work with the airlines on for those attitudinal barriers because the airlines, when they call in, they usually call into some mover, a people mover, uh, a crew that's going to help move, transfer a person with a physical impairment to the next gate, but they don't get the message. And so now like, well, why can't I just put them in the, the regular chair and just get them the other side? Because it's not their chair. That's not their legs. It's like, and then, and, then, and, then, and then there's another issue that happens if they damage the chair, they damage the wheels, but now it's just like you're taking a bat to your legs and swinging and cracking your legs and breaking your legs. It's the same effect. Or if they break your wheelchair on the way over, 
Those are things that are hindrances. If we take it out of the international level of competition and take it down to just movement with inside of even our own Olympic and Paralympic team family, when we go to Washington, D.C., and we get the chance to you know, go to the White House, we have bus transportation. And the bus transportation lifts the, the person in the wheelchair up into the back of the bus. So they can't even come into the front of the bus, and now they have to sit in a special section in the back, and they can't even interact with their teammates on the bus. They're isolated in the back. And then if the lift breaks down, how do we get them off the bus? And all these other things that we have to think about. Or should we use a taxi cab? So all these other things that we're thinking about can be, I think, placed into solutions or opportunities, just like I was talking about the opportunities that I now saw with having one leg. You know, what are the things in our lives that we have to amputate in order to create the opportunities in our lives? What are the opportunities that we can see to help somebody that may be a wheelchair user advance even inside of our own country? Right? To get them around faster, to, to make sure that they can get off that plane quick. Uh, is there a universal design chair they can get from one place to the next place and make sure that everything works seamlessly and is, is uh, what's the word? Uh, fluid. It's fluid. It's, it's, uh, it's a fluid process instead of a, a, a sticky, you know, a, a filled barriers and hurdles. Those are things I think that are, are the, the mindset of what comes to the next level, to the next generation, to see how we can make things of all universal design. So if I'm going to build a room like this, I'm going to make sure there are. It's going to be seamless. You're not going to realize that it's a, a, a graduated tiered seating because all the chairs will be like that. There'll be some open spaces everywhere, and the person that's in a wheelchair or visually impaired can just walk right up, kind of little slope ramp. And to us, it's seamless. We don't even recognize it. We just go, "Oh, that's, that's unique design," and we just sit down in our chair. But to them, it's a gradual, gradual uh, slope. And they're in with everybody else because, like April says, everybody that's in the room wants to play together. Okay, stop and pause right there. I'm gonna show you a few pictures, and then we'll wrap up. So, I was thinking about you know some of the designs I've seen with like lawn chairs designs. Chicago had a really cool thing they were gonna do with if they would have won the Chicago 2012 bid. The whole the whole bid was. Um, Blue green, so everything was water and green design. Everything, everything was going to be turned back in to that. And the stadium seats would have been turned into to wheelchairs and sit around the world. I don't know how that would have worked, but that was a pretty cool concept, I, I thought, right? And so this, when you're thinking about countries and you're, if you've been to different nations, it's even in, in countries like England that have you know hard streets and cobblestone and things. It's really difficult to have plastic. And metal together. I mean, it's just they just break. Uh, so we got to think about things that are rugged and they're going to they're going to stick and, and stay together. But here's some designs I think that are pretty cool that I have seen. I'm going to try and open all these up. All right, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so this one is like an all-terrain, and you can see it's 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 very simplistic, right? We're not not a lot of bells and whistles on it, but very good knobby tires. So that's gonna it's going to be the, the tires won't puncture as fast on difficult terrain. That's what I love right there. <laughs> Give me that, man. But this not this hedgehog is not going to really work over over someplace else because it's it's powered, right? So we can't really look at that unless there's some type of power pack that we can design that is. Um, solar powered or wind powered is something that might uh, help brakes our you know, braking energy. You guys know that stuff. I don't know that stuff. So here's that got the kid again. Another one of those simple designs uh, to get people into spaces where they, they want to be. And of course, the big mama <laughs> track. <laughs> Love that one. And actually, just uh, the Marine Corps just gave a kid. A, a device, sort of just like like this. Well, uh, I thank you for your time that you have given me today. And again, if you do have questions, uh, I I love answering questions. And so, if you want to just hit me up uh, there, if you want to just you know either bring me there or just my email address is john at johnregister.com, and you can just send me shoot me an email as well. So, all right. Thank, thank you so you. much for your time.